all, the gang's all here. We we summon your fabulousness. Good morning, Maeve. Doug is somewhere under that beanie, colleagues. Oh, we're in, we're interrupting Doug again with his breakfast. How are you, Doug? Just wave, mate. Yeah, I'm bloody great, mate. Never get between a man and a feed, in my experience. Great to see you. Oh, Sophia's back. Wonderful. Susan's back. Sophia, darling, how are you? Are you okay? Oh, you're looking gorgeous, by the way. Looking gorgeous. Well, thank you. This is why I come to these meetings. It's just a little series of affirmations every week. <laughs> you, you deserve that. How are you traveling, my darling? I'm well. I'm um, dealing with a continuous stream of rejected job applications at the moment, which it gets a bit grinding, but um, well, we keep on keeping on, don't we? Look, we might talk about that. Obviously, we always open things up for fabulousness, we're, we're, but it's great to see you. Liam is joining us in the middle of the night uh, from the People's Republic of the Northwest of England. Good, good evening, Liam. Hello, everybody. Hello, Tara. Hi. Uh, we we adore you and Ben Ben Liam Liam Ben that's fantastic Be beautiful Kate has joined us again Jen's in we love you Jen you know it to be true Dr oh we're on the road with Jen gee that's going to be a road movie that's going to sell well done you fantastic um and Liam mate I tell you, just one thing I want to acknowledge before we start digital office hours the last time we may be coming from Aotearoa New Zealand so uh, on behalf of the Tanga Defender we we thank you for joining us from Aotearoa New Zealand so Liam I did note overnight that uh, I didn't think the British government could do anything worse, but I now see that they're deciding to delete a whole series of arts programs as well. Uh, oh, yeah. So, you know, I've been watching a lot of Judith Butler's work. She's doing a tour of the UK, Who's Afraid of Gender? Yeah. Who's Afraid of Anti-Intellectualism? It yeah. seems to be a message for our um, DCs right now and the choices that they're making. It's 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 astonishing. And Liam, if it's of use to you in uh, the the fights that exist in late capitalism, Liam, uh, our particular version of your tour is a guy by the name of Scomo, Scott Morris. Is it Scotty? Is it Sunshine Scott Scotty? Scott A. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Scotty sounds a lot better. He he decided that he was going to render humanities courses at a higher fee level the, than the sciences to, to stop people doing those courses because um, they're at a higher fee level because they don't end up with jobs. And a whole series of, of course, studies were done. We, we want everybody. We want all the disciplines. That's what a comprehensive university is. But, of course, people did the study that show people with a Bachelor of Arts degree have a higher employment rate than people with a biology degree. Absolutely. And I just think, you know, if you're not aware of the political context in the UK at the moment, it is zombie neoliberalism kind of strikes back version five um we've got this importation of late neoliberalism late capitalism which is just like what the americans have tried and tested with over the last 40 or so years and it's just it's just killing everything um so <laughs> we do a general election tara pretty soon under the fixed term parliament act but we've got our prime minister prime minister i say because he's been elected by the british public um, basically saying, laughing and going, oh, well, it's just not what the public want, you know? So he's doing that kind of like proto-fascist kind of move where it's like, I tell you what you want, you know, I dictate the picture, you know, you're playing my game. It's one of those. And some of our university um, starlets are repeating that game on our institutions. Um, so, yeah. The bully boys are back in power. And and look, it is it? amazing. It is amazing, Liam. Obviously, Ben in Otoro, New Zealand, there's all sorts of fabulous political forces happening as well. But Liam, I'm trying to do some work, and this is hard granular research work at the moment, to really work <laughs> through the difference between populism on the right, populism on the left, and representative popular culture, and actually differentiating those three forces. And I think we're going to need that. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's just, so I'm at an institution which doesn't actually have any, it's, it's mostly teacher ed, yes. arts-based courses and um, social sciences and um, the humanities. Um, our sociology degree is ending, um, which is um, at the end of this academic year, which is 
you know, a great time to be alive. Um, I arrived at an institution and was told, oh, your degree is being pulled. So that's what's kind of rendered some of the decisions of some of our colleagues. I mean, I've been told my job's safe, um, but you don't know how long for, you know, until you've no. run away no. from the big bad wolf, you know. Look, look, Liam, you're legendary, and thank you for saying that. I will summon the great Red Queen herself, uh, my BFF, my husband's BFF. I will summon Kylie. Uh, hello, Kyle's. Are you are you with Doug? Are you are you having breakfast with Doug? And you got to put a beanie on. What's happening? <laughs> this is my new hair color. I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> it's very good. Cool. Change. Of course. It's also hiding a lot of the grey, so that's good. <laughs> um, but, Kyles, I was talking about it with wonderful Piper and hello to Piper and Aidan who watch this asynchronously. But the the horror of this, that all of us are sort of 12 and a half minutes away from being sacked and how one actually continues to live that way for a year, two years, ten years. It, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And it's not fair um, because it impacts not just your career part but it's that I know we've talked about in the past where getting loans and being able to do the other parts of your world which relies on the historical view of you having full-time permanent work um yeah look exactly right yeah. it's disturbing and I also worry Liam it's part of the heteronormative thing of universities as well that our yeah. universities are based on an academic having their job subsidised by their spouse that is not in academic life. No one seems to have written a lot about that, but so that's mm -hmm. heteronormative and it's assuming that this other human being will subsidise our universities. Well, yeah, and it's in, happening internationally as well. So I'll just give you a bit of a tale, something that I've been informed of because somebody told me um, on a journal editorial board that I needed to be aware of this a review for an article that I've written with my colleague um, who is very new to research. Um, the review was, um, the peer review, it got through peer review smashingly. Um, I saw the peer review report and it was from a fabulous um, professor in Turkey, eh? Turkey, um, a professor of gender studies, um, female professor. And it was edited by um, a white Western academic male and he said that 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 scholarly review of my work doesn't count because it's not thorough enough so I was like what the hell is going on here so I got the I managed to get access to the reviewer's report and I'd found out who had reviewed it and um, because that information was given to me and I was like it's just it's just xenophobia do you know what I mean in <laughs> I know this is another issue but yeah, I've had to find a new editor, um, associate editor and a new reviewer um, because that's been kind of discarded. So, and I just wanted to, you know, informally thank, you know, if there are ever listening out there, the person who did the original review, um, because it was noted and it's important and what they had to say contributes towards the discourse, but that'll never get seen now. That's amazing. That, and that's amazing. And the only experience, we'll go straight to wonderful Susan, but my only other experience of that was for a particular book that I won't mention, but for a very big publisher when I was sort of desperate as a very young scholar to get, you know, the big international book. So I was desperate and would have done anything. But I had three reviewers that said it was fantastic, We're already completed book, so they were assessing a whole book, three that said it was mm -hmm. fantastic. But the editor didn't like those three because they said the book was fantastic and they were after an excuse to knock it back. We ended up with nine reviewers for the book, all of which, oh my all of days. which, thank the gods, and I still had to be, be a bit of the sort of white working class girl that I am and boss about and go, look, you've now got nine. You've got nine, and I wrote to her boss. And I, so what more do you need? Because they really were after any excuse to to knock it back. And that book's still in print, you know, amazing. It's like, like hanging it's in. absolutely, and it's like, is a female academic's word ever enough? You know, like oh. it's it's xenophobic, it's, it's sexist, it's just, yeah. yeah. I'm going to call it out for what it is, and I don't care, you yeah. know, the consequences. And, of course, and, and look, Liam, I'll call it out too, because remember, some have also, and I'm looking straight at the rain, of course, women women 
also so it's not like whatever genitalia you've got that's what creates the misogyny it's it's misogyny exists throughout the culture that is just the demeaning of the feminine wherever it is found liam so i think that's a very powerful statement mate amazing absolutely and our allison always i'll let you get to susan as well hi susan um our Alison always says this, you know, like, you know, once you're the classed as a female dross over 60, you know, you just, your opinion's redundant, you know, and I just, and I really treasure that, what she says to me, and I've got her a rock off mug um, as a leaving present, but it's just somebody who's been really important on my journey yeah. and has echoed a lot of this as well yeah. and has kept me in a job because I would have walked a long time ago otherwise. A powerful human. We forget how important some of these great humans are. Liam, you're legendary. Now, Susan, and I just want to make sure we actually do get to Sophia and job applications because I think that's a, a good use of our day and shells in too. But Susan, where do you want to take us, my love? Uh, I am literally, I was literally started a call with you, came off the call to, sorry, I read a WhatsApp message, a group WhatsApp message, and I got so angry in the middle of this time that I got off. I muted, I went over on another phone, called somebody and shouted at them. So let yes. me try to give you the scenario. I am leading a research group that I've gotten some of the small amount of funding from within my university. Sure. And two people in the team, it's about seven of us, decided to submit an abstract to a conference. And somebody called me two days ago to say, oh, they're submitting the So I said, send me the abstract. And they're going to acknowledge me. So I already thought, this is interesting. They're using AI. And that's what I didn't even know for the quality of the story, they're even using AI. So, so wait, you're using AI, you didn't even tell me? I'm like, that might be good, but would be good for me to know if I'm the lead. Anyway, so I'm talking about that. And I said, well, send me the conference. So I got the conference abstract, which by the way, my name is not on, I am acknowledged. And when I look at it, I see findings from the study that I'm the lead. Can you see why I'm a bit um puzzled? Look, and the more I look at it, the more I am perturbed. I'm perturbed because I wasn't invited to be part of this conference paper, even as the third as the third person. I'm perturbed because results from the study I am leading is in the conference abstract. I'm perturbed because when I read it carefully. I also see that I don't see the logic. So what's in the, uh, what they do is they, they give the themes from a particular part of the project. And then they conclude that AI, AI according to them, which is probably true, AI is, is more efficient to do thematic analysis than manual, whatever. This is what they say. I don't know. But the point is they did not give the, the, the qualitative or quantitative to say how they got to that position. Uh, can so I say, I Susan, I just looked at Jen's face. I just looked at Jen's face, right, with, like, more efficient. Anyway, That's exactly I what we need, see the more logic. Efficient. So they had an aim that made sense. They had a method that made sense. But then they, how they jumped from the the results, which were themes, to a conclusion that AI was more efficient did not make sense to me. Right. Well, and minor things, like it had a method that said it used the uh, auto AI for the transcribing and I as the project lead knows it's auto AI and then there was a research assistant who helped to you know to to make it like you know accurate so to me either to say it's transcribed or you put it uh, AI aided by humans the more I look at it and one of my colleagues not me suggested mm -hmm. but wait this this project wasn't did have ethics approval because this is not the same project as our project. Remember, no, I actually think as with ethics training, it would be this. It would just, if I was a chair, this came to me, I would say, oh, yeah, this doesn't need to go to, it would just be desk approval right away. But mm -hmm. it didn't really go because this is none of our research aim. So they're now having a new research aim. Does AI work well with, and as I go on and on and on, guess what? Both people in the middle of the misrepresentation. So the person on the, one person in the paper told me, they talked to me for half an hour, just about an hour ago. Mm. They tell me they're coming off the project. And then the other person who's not feeling well, I know because of the WhatsApp group today, now he calls person B, calls person A, who is being told that I don't trust her, which is not true, or that the team don't trust her, so she just wrote a little that she doesn't like um, problems with teams in at work. And so since she's not trusted, she's coming off the project. 
And I am also distressed, not just because of all the other things. I have taken project funding and I don't have enough team members. And the person who's come off, she's really smart, even though she's hard to work with. And now I have even less team members. And Tara, I am so distressed. And I was literally crying. Sweet where heart. I go? Let me stop. Oh, sweetheart, we'll handle what this. What should I do? You. Right, so darling, uh, darling, we're with you, sweetheart. So let's handle this. We can manage this, Angel. Now, to my ignorance, I don't know uh, Jamaican <laughs> research integrity policies. And I tell you, after this yes. call and after Right Club, I'll look that up. Whether there's a West Indian protocol or a Jamaican protocol, I will find out. But there is the Vancouver protocol, which is the, mm -hmm. the founding protocol for most research integrity protocols around the world, okay? So the first thing is there are research integrity breaches here in the australian system uh there'll be multiple breaches here the first is that you have and you mu you must have an opportunity to be an author so you can't mm -hmm. be included they needed to come to you and say would you right. like to be an author so that that is accurate that is a research integrity breach also, in terms of the, the ethics matter, research integrity, breach, write it down, easy, full stop. Now, the third element there is artificial intelligence. Now, I'm doing work on that at the moment for all of us, for PhD students, but also thinking about it and research integrity, right? And you you can't be simply making re, uh, making AI the, the panacea for any research answer or question you might have, okay? So it mm -hmm. can't be used. It's got to be declared. It's got to be declared as an issue, as a risk mitigation, or again, it is a research integrity breach, Susan. So what I would say to you is let, let's go <laughs> to your universities, your university's mm -hmm. research integrity policies. Let's, if you want to send me, just confidentiality, if you want to send me the grant that you have been granted, there will be research integrity protocols within that. I mean, we'll assess that. You're absolutely fine. This will this will not be, be resolved in the way you think it will. Um, you There are three grounds for a research integrity investigation. Okay? Let's mm -hmm. do this. Let's do this. You're fine. You're fine, darling. You're fine. Okay? You're fine. No, this won't happen. This won't happen. And worst case scenario, at the conclusion of this call, you write to the person who is running the conference and you express those three matters. And then that Oh, they've already they've already withdrawn because they heard of my So what happens? I went to a meeting today and the lead the of research at the lead of research was talking about research groups and he had a list of items and on one item was dissemination of research. So I said out loud, well, just this week, I had a problem with dissemination of research that I'm leading. And I didn't remember that the per one of the person was in there. So then they called me half an hour later to say, I was actually in a meeting and I sound put out. Yeah, yeah. I sound, I say put out because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, now, now, Susan, sound put out. yeah. Now, now, Susan, Jamaicans are a classy people. Australians are not. And we we mm -hmm. describe those people as gutless, mate, gutless. Like if you're going to do it, you front up, girlfriend, and you take the consequences. So you've won, Susan. And, again, my old argument from my 96-year-old father is when you've won, you probably don't have to do much more than that. What I would do is, though, log the research integrity matter. I would report that to your university just as a matter of noting. But, 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 but did you hear my other concern? I have a resource constraint. I don't mean a money resource. I have a people resource. Yes. I'm doing too many projects, too many things. Yeah. And one of the people, one of the persons who came out, she's very smart. So she's very difficult to work with. But yeah. because she's smart, I was happy to happy, happy, you yes. know, in quotation marks. No. I to have her as part of the team. No, I know that she's put out, I won't try to get her back in. But the point is no, I have even less people who have the skills. Now, and now, so I also put up because of that. Now, do you have any recommendations look, for what I, I, I like? I do my mindset on this matter. I, look, I do, and I think we can solve this for you reasonably quickly. And by the way, and Vita, love you. Her hair's up. I'm frightened, Kylie. Um, as our favorite project manager, and who you and I. Um, on a daily basis have to have to manage quite difficult people that really do hate each other and don't want to work together at all. Um, <laughs> so so what, what I do in this circumstance is I individually um, work with, oh, thank you, Sita, that's what I would do too. We'll go to Sita as well. I, I would individually work with those colleagues. And Susan, if one of our colleagues is unwell, 
creating a space where they can do what they can do and be be kind and comfortable with that but i would handle individuals and also i would i would fragment and render bespoke everybody's contribution and that will enable research integrity as well uh, what would you, what would you do Carl? Um, yeah, that's probably the, the first place. If you've got that one person that is just that unwell, give them that space. Let them be involved in what they can cope with if, but if they are sick, let them be sick. There's nothing worse than they're giving bad data or bad analysis if their brain's not working properly. With the other stuff, um, work out what are the, the chunks of work that have to be done and are they having to be done in a certain order? And again, it's working out that program of what needs to be done and just breaking it into those smaller chunks. And if you haven't got the resources to do that, if you can get others, branch out, upskill the people that you've got, if you can, to do those other bits. It's Again, it's just prioritising and, and working out a flow of what needs to be done. Brilliantly said. Lorraine, considering the sco scope and scale of what you've had to manage in your career um, and the multiple personalities, is that where? what else would you add for our Susan? Oops. I'm going to... Gotcha. Yeah. Um, apologies. I've been distracted on the side because I'm going to catch a flight that's been cancelled and it's just been rebooked and yeah, lots going on over this side. No, uh, darling, you've done really well. Yeah, so I, I, do I get it. Apologize. The only I'm advice, from Susan. Yeah. I, yeah. The only advice I'd get, Lorraine, from you is obviously you've had to handle multiple stakeholders, most of which hate each other's guts a lot of the time. So. Yeah. How, how do you create a workflow that acknowledges the community and the dissonance and gets the work done, mate? Yeah, I think detaching yourself from the emotional side. So when you need to, you know, uh, be invested in producing something, take the emotion away from it, address the emotion later with loved ones that you can rely on that are supportive and helpful. Yes, Keep focused, get the job done. Yeah, cut mentalize. That's that's what I would. Uh, that's what I. That's the way I get through issues like that. Because otherwise, if you get drawn in emotionally, it can tap into you know all our insecurities that have probably been there for many years. You know, all sorts of yeah ugly things that can come out of the the box. So yeah, for yeah. me, just keeping a lid on that and and addressing it cold I suppose in a way like not taking it personally I think have very good layers of self-protection I, I always truly believe um, things that come towards you are not about you because the only people you really let close enough are the people you love and trust so anybody else's interactions with you is about them not about you Oh, bloody hell, I feel like a different human. Lorraine, you're amazing, and that's why we rely on you. The only other final advice I'd offer, and I would really love then to touch base with the beautiful Jenny and the beautiful Anvita, who we care about more than life, but the only other advice I use every day, and this is part of my windscreen wiper thing, is I treat contemporary work in late capitalism as if it is um, a cricket over, and I treat ev as the batsman, and I treat every single ball on its own terms. If you're going to get to 100, you don't think about getting to 100, you play the next ball. And I think that's probably the only way we get through these situations now. So I hope that helps beautiful Susan. Let's go to Anvita and then beautiful Jen, because I want to hear how you're both going. So Anvita, my love, we love you like life itself. What's What's been happening? And your hair's up. As I said, I'm frightened when I see it that way. But My, my hair is up only because it has been raining in Brisbane and it is frizzy. It's a frizzy mess. Um, it's about four times its size. Let's just say that. <laughs> but otherwise, I'm okay. I've been away for the last couple of weeks because um, I've had uh, no, I've had a competing meeting around the same time that we usually have these. Yes. Um, and I'm coming towards the end of I think my final data analysis. So that's been going on in the background, and I'm doing well overall. Oh, that is fantastic! And can you see, have you got a sense about the length of time left? Can you see? Can you see the end of the over, Anvita? Uh, um, I'll let you know in about a week's time, Dara. Oh, I'm excited, but <laughs> it, you, is, it is. I can, but yeah, are no, you no, feeling, not preemptively. Are you feeling okay? Are you actually? Are you centered? Are you all right? I think I'm okay now. I think I'm okay now. It was a couple. It was a little. Um, I'm not going to say tough, but it was just busy. I had a lot of competing deadlines over the yes. last month. And into into August, sorry, into April, um, and all of that I think is on track. I got everything sent off on time, so yeah. 
Oh, fantastic. All good. We are thrilled you are precious. And look, Jen is the other. Jen has been like, there's a third person in my marriage this week, and it has been Jen. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a, so sweet. How are you going? Obviously, a, a, lot, a lot's been happening. It's felt like the, the entirety of the internet has been revolving around you this week. How are you going? Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks, Tara. Uh, how am I going? I'm doing this meeting on my iPad from my car. That yep. sort of says it all. It does, mate. Um, yeah, um, the, I didn't catch the name of the first speaker that I saw when I came online today, but she was saying about applying for jobs. And, Sophia, yep. Um, yeah, so very similar for me. I've been concerned over, like, what's been on my mind the last couple of weeks, the precarious nature of employment with universities. You know, I did eight years at Menzies and now a bit over four years at CDU and um, you know, I have to leave. I, I, um, yeah, I just need a job with a longer contract. And, it, and yeah, so that's an issue. And managing this transition between the timing of finishing my PhD, but also, you know, getting work and moving on to the next career thing, being really sad about leaving CDU after 12 years as, you know, full-time staff but also you know I've been a student on and off at CDU since 1997. Great year. I'm from the territory even though I'm in Brisbane now but um yeah I have felt very loyal to CDU over the years I've done two master's degrees yeah. I've taught in various MPH you know called been course coordinators so even though I'm excited for what comes next and I know that it's my time I just I have to you know, go and get a well-paying job somewhere else. I'm I'm sad to leave CDU. So that's been, yeah, that's just been a lot this week. And then juggling, like having to get um, like a copy of my thesis to you, Tara. Thank you so God. Not understanding why, because it's like, are they, is CDU expelling me? Like, I don't understand what's happening. Or this is just for another month of scholarship. Like, yeah. Do I put all my energy into trying to get one more month of scholarship money? No, I need to put my energy into getting a really good job from now and just balancing and try, me saying to, you know, my supervisors and that, like, like who cares? One more month of scholarship, that's not going to change my life, but a job. and But then saying, actually, like, you just have to go through this process this is the process now. So, um, yeah, and then one last thing, because I reckon I'm on a call with people who appreciate this, like really having to deal with my own stuff about like I don't want anyone to see my work until it's what I think is like really perfect. Like, and that is, you know, how they say don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So that was like a big thing for me this week too, like, oh, everything's in draft, doesn't matter. Just let other people. Now, now well, Jen, thank God it was you, Tara. Not many people say Happy that, Jen, but thank you, you very but... much. Most people thank Satan or they go hail Satan <laughs> at different points. Uh, but, Jen, can I say, darling, what that involved, and, again, the nature of higher education is everything is supposed to, everything's heightened. And, of course, everything's not heightened. All, all the sending of the draft to me was about was just checking in that you had work to then release the final stage of the funding, like you would with any grant, right? So as I said to you in the email yesterday, I've done the compliance read. And so that was the compliance read. I did that in, I think, 45 minutes in real time. And I went, fantastic, release the funding to Jen. Uh, but then can I also say, Jen, my darling, I'm now doing for you a more robust draft. And can I say to you, Jen, I don't know if it's going to make any difference to you. We've got a lot to say to you about a lot of things. But, Jen, darling, it's excellent work. As someone who's reading it and loving it, and I am a very tough supervisor. I'm a tough examiner. I'm a terrible human. And, Jen, I am loving it. It is beautifully written. It is exciting. It is riveting research. If you're a terrible human, you're our terrible human. That's and we're right. Bloody good. Lucky to have you. I belong to you. Uh, but Jen, <laughs> one thing I wanted to say, and well, it might involve Sophia as well, but other colleagues, and Shelley is obviously my heart lives in another human's body, and that's Shelley's body. But Jen, darling, 
when you were speaking, I, of course, tear up as I always do because I'm just a random, but Jen, I shared the feeling that you expressed there about that 12, 13 years of your life. Probably the closest I ever came to that uh, was when I was 10 years at Murdoch University as a, a young human. You know, I started as a B-level bunny academic and finished as an associate professor and then went off to England um, for a British chair. But I, I loved that university. I believed in the project of that university right it it was it was like, like blood in my body right i believed in it and then different leaders came in and destroyed it destroyed the vision the heart the guts the point of that university and so about five years in so i did five years sort of in this torturous dreadful institution that had lost its way but but jen to this day i still the, the only university I've ever believed in is Murdoch University when I was 28 years old, right? And I, be, I believed in the project. And I, when I left Murdoch, and I still do, I grieve every day. I grieve every day for the loss, not to, not to myself, but the loss to the tens of thousands of students that would have been enlivened through that project. So whenever we leave an institution after a long period of time or a short period of time, there is grieving there, and like all grieving, death dollar hat on, like all grieving, you can't walk around it. You've got to walk through it, and you've got to walk with it. So you're, you're doing fantastically, and that's part of that's part of the process, that you believe in what the university is, and hold on to that, Jen, and let's hope we find it in another organisation, institution mm -hmm. paradigm. I love you, Jen. Um, let's go to beautiful Kate and beautiful Maeve. Talk to us, you two. Kate, talk to me, darling. Oh, hi. I just want to give everyone some um, hope. Um, some of you know, and you know, Tara, that I've been working on preventing pressure ulcers in hospitals, the community, and aged care for 35 years. I was a founder of the Wound Care Association, founder of the National Body, blah, blah, blah. Nobody has taken any notice of me until now. <laughs> I've been um, called a whistleblower for reporting pressure ulcers to management, but I've also said this is what I can do to prevent them. I have published work on prevention. And well, it's dead simple. It's so simple. Anyway, the other day I had a, an email from the International Group of Pressure Ulcer Prevention People from Japan, uh, lots of countries in Asia, the States, Canada, the UK, all across Australia, okay. inviting me to be a member of the group to look at risk, which is dead simple, dead simple, dead simple. But whether they actually listen to me this time or whether I'm just shoved in a corner again, which has happened so many times, but that's just to give you all hope. You might have to wait another 35 years. <laughs> now, now, Kate, you are a blessing to us. And and can I say, Jen, she, she's underplaying herself, our Kate. She has transformed so many of the way in which we, we treat, we understand pressure ulcers, particularly in aged care facilities. You've done an amazing job, Kate. And the idea that you're finally being listened to, do you remember we talked about a few weeks ago, actually it might have been a couple of months ago, about Bob Dylan. I'm obsessed about Bob Dylan. And, you know, Bob Dylan never appealed to an audience. The line was always the audience came to Bob. He didn't change what the hell Bob Dylan was doing, but the audience found him. And Kate, this is your time. The audience has found you. I think you're right, because over the years I was invited to talk here and overseas at local conferences, or big conferences, and that all died down. Nobody wanted me. Everyone argued with me about the cause of pressure ulcers, but I knew I was right, mm -hmm. and they were all in a muddle R wrong. <laughs> wrong. so maybe this time before i get to 80 it'll all change look i'm going to put that on the pressure ulcers it's criminal it's it's neglect they're foreseeable and they're preventable and they're a huge legal issue wow. and that's another side of my work i do medical legal reports on patients that develop pressure ulcers and have lower limb amputations or they die or you're amazing, Kate. Anyway, that's enough for but, me. But it's an archetype. That's an archetype for Jen to just hold your nerve, girlfriend. Centre. Breathe. 
center and we're going to i'm hoping we've got time after we've talked to beautiful Maeve. i really want to help sophia and jen and let's think about getting into work let's do this and obviously we've got a lot of people they've had to fight their way into work but Maeve, talk to us my love Thank you, Tara. Good morning, everyone. Morning, um, I just wanted to, um, Jen, as you were talking, I was really relating. I'm trying to read. I'm under pressure. I'm trying to read stuff on sound and sonics at the moment, and it came to tone, and then I, I was listening, and I thought, I really relate to your tone. I, I don't know how to, like, yes. what to do with that, but I really relate to the tone in which you're expressing yourself. Yeah, I very, love very much. I love where, you where, saying that, Maeve. That's that's beautiful. And I agree because there's heart there, right? There's heart. And uh, I could see Ben's face. It's like this is real. I mean, there's there's so okay. much rubbish. There's so much and, rubbish in our life. Go, Maeve. Yeah, thanks, Tara. And um, yeah, so I think that what nicely put, thank you, Tara. Um, because that extends what I was saying. And I, I sort of didn't realize that, but now now saying that I do. And I I've moved to universities quite a few times, um, partly multiple reasons, which we don't need to go into. And I have had attachments as I go. And then I've had like maybe attachments to the tutor who really got me, you know, and who changed my life because she believed I could do a PhD. And that was before Tara. And I wouldn't be in, I wouldn't have met Tara without the tutor who believed I could do a PhD. Because I was like, can I, can I, I don't know, I don't know. But a particular tutor believed in me. And then Tara did as well. So I think um, I also have scholarship, you know, different stuff, different stuff. And I think many of us do. And I think whatever you've got to do to prioritise your life as you, the human, that will ultimately pay off the rest you know, whatever you've got to do to be Jen like and to work it out for you, everything else will fall into place if you prioritise yourself in it. Shelley, straight there. Shelley, Shelley was like like singing that one. Shell, do you want to say hello before I go to Sophia and trying to manage people in late capitalism? How are you, Shell? Oh, sound, beautiful. Sound, sound, darling. Oh, we've got to do a bit hey. of a dark vogue. Hello, Madonna Vogue. Hello. You can hear me? I can, Angel. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to just say my heart has been on my sleeve this whole conversation. I just feel for everybody and um, I can relate as well, but not from a university context. Um, and someone just said something to me once, which was just to help me realise why I'm feeling so deeply. It was like a professional breakup, like where you just Please. believe so deeply. And when the time came to split, it's not personal, but it is personal. Like you're experiencing it and feeling it and you are going through it. And um, I think the biggest thing is just to kind of remember that you've exactly what Maeve was talking about, just, you know, how to be your own advocate and how to surround yourself by people who, um, have are in your corner and will help you um, have really healthy um, mental narratives and just good decisions to just edge forward in the direction that is going to be, you know, true to you and what you need to become out of this opportunity that's been created. But it won't feel like that for a little while, but it actually is. Um, you are amazing. Can I say, Cheryl, just to use your... I'm taking a note. Good oh. mental narrative. Good mental, good mental narrative. Look, Shelley said last week boundary objects, and I've been just—I've had boundary objects all around my space all week, Shell. I mean, I've, I've sort of got boundary objects. I'm—I'm I'm going to have whole pe papers around it, but I don't know what it is yet. But I'm excited. Um, me Jen, too. Me too. I'm excited. But Jen, she, she's amazing. But Shell, just to put your professional hat on, and this is where I'm going to go to to Soph, but I'm also going to activate Jamie and Liam as well. Um, but Shell. What professional advice would you offer to somebody moving through career transitions at this point? Because obviously that's part of your professional expertise, taking someone from where they are to where they want to be. Any Anything you'd, you'd say to help that transition? I think they do go hand in hand. Like I think it is, uh, it is, it is holding the personal and professional because I think that's the – the we we tend to separate it but i think in our hearts and soul and our intellectual mind we there's an incongruence that's happening and we are just needing to kind of um rebuild ourselves as a whole and pull it all together because you are enough 
and the opportunity is there and what you need to do will come. And so I think it's, again, just um, I in my work, I just talk about leaning into the discomfort because there are, and it has to be safety. That's why like surrounding yourself with the right people is really important. But just leaning in to the things that are in your life that are giving you the right feedback that it's the direction you should go into, even if it is uncomfortable, um, would be kind of if I knew more, uh, you know, I would be more specific. <laughs> um, yes. I don't know, Tara. I don't know if that's what you're sort of like thinking, but. Shell, Shell, if you look at Kylie's face, Kylie and I are like, our life has just changed. We're weeping uncontrollably. Look at Kylie. I was like, I can't look at Kylie. I'm having one. I can't look at Kylie. Um, Shell, that, I, I love the notion of, of being in the incongruence, right? I love mm. that and how we manage that. We're going to come back to that. We'll quickly go to Susan, but then we really need to get some strategies in place this week for the last few minutes to get people ready for jobs. Okay, so Susan, what can we do to help, darling? No, it's not to help me. I'm trying to see if I can get the question. So I think you were talking about is it career transitions? This is the last question. Get, getting people, yeah, getting so people I, into work in tough times. I, I, well, it's not really into, so maybe this is not a real question. So I have been in the same job, if you can believe it, for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And do you know in that job for 25 years, I have literally, if this makes sense, changed careers. No, I've only been an academic staff member. But in the middle of literally, hating more than 50% easily of my job, I looked to myself and said, what could I do? So I realized I didn't like things about the curriculum. So I got into, for free for curriculum, then I got into the school and then the faculty curriculum. I had issues with ethics. And so I got ethics training. So I'm just saying, even in my job, I have said, what could I do? And sometimes it hasn't gone anywhere. But sometimes I've actually done things that I am really proud of myself. I have been involved in whole degree development and basically it's been in the middle of me saying, I hate this about my life in this one job. What can I do? And I would say for anybody who's looking for a better life, whether it is for work or for your life, yeah. say both, is there something that really upsets me? Can I do something about it? Even yeah. for free now. And is there anything I'm really good at? Can I use my strengths in those ways? And I think that can actually Brilliant. lead to having a better life. I hope that can help somebody. D darling, it can. And can I say, that's also, Susan's amazing. That's also the gift of being able to reinvent yourself in the same institution in different jobs. That's a blessing. Wonderful, Kylie. And then we'll go to Liam because I'd love to sort of have us all some action plans going forward to to help Sophia this week. So Kylie, then Liam. Go, Kyles. I was actually going to start on that action plan or potentially some steps um, for, do that. Let's uh, do it. Let's for do it everyone actually. And just also from what Jen was saying, first thing like Susan was saying, look at your skills. You might be in academia, but again, those skill sets are really, really important out in industry. Like it's, it's not just you can be in one and not be in the other. You can move between the two as I've, I've shown, but it's also tell people the biggest way of getting jobs around the place is the word of mouth. And again, from my personal experience, Tell your network. Tell your network you're looking. Get them looking. Keep their eyes out because they might hear something that might be useful for you that's not necessarily going to be advertised or they know someone that knows someone. Um, but, Jen, you were saying about not wanting to extend that extra month. Don't see it as just extending that month and then doing something about it. It gives you that time. you still got money coming in, but it's getting through that hump to get a job that you can then go on to. You're not sort of in no man's land with no money coming in. That's exactly it. So, so work on the skills, tell people that you're in the market, but also work the transition. So, in other words, work in these transitional phases, these liminal, liminal phases. Keep yeah. moving. I think Use that transition period to your advantage. Use it. Don't see it as a, just a, a blank space. Use it to either get the skills that you might need. Get If you do get interviews, get feedback and improve yourself. LinkedIn training, any way to improve those skills that you might get the feedback in, just make yourself a better product wherever you end up going. I think that's fantastic. And also speaking on behalf, we'll go to Liam now, but also speaking, say, on behalf of John in particular, this is of advantage for our historians, for our people to think about consultancy, think about sole proprietor work, think about 
writing, professional, public histories, all of these things are available and you don't sort of think about it and then you see that they appear. So all sorts of different working environments are possible. How are you going, John? How, by uh, the way, well, congratulations, you. your thesis is under examination. We need to acknowledge, John, the thesis is out for examiners. So, But, John, I've been thinking about you and I um, as the younger members of this community, but also thinking about what maybe not full-time work looks like, but different you know, gig economy variables as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm feeling a lot more relaxed now. I mean, I just had a, a week in Tasmania and lovely around the waterfalls when they got a little bit of rain. Um, South Bruny Island, very nice. Um, listen, I, I don't know. I feel a little unrelaxed. I mean, I, I've had some ups and downs all through my career, but I, I go and do what I want to do, what I... I, I, I feel, um, you know, it is there. I, I go and find a, an opportunity somehow. Perhaps I've just been lucky. I keep coming back and thinking, well, we're really fortunate. We're, we're not in um, Gaza or Palestine. Yeah. But I, ha I know one time when I, you know, was really struggling, I, I come back from overseas. I didn't have a job. And and when you're worried about where your next meal is going to come from, you, your values do change. You you can't have that um, beautiful look at at all the altruistic and and right ways of doing things if you you don't know you know if you're on the point of starvation or something yeah, else. Mate. Yeah, mate. But you yeah, believe things, and something will will turn up. I mean, when I didn't have too much time on my hands, I I <laughs> you know you, you do all sorts of things. And that extra time, I um, filled out one of those things on the back of a cornflakes packet and uh, won a free trip to two, for two to Tahiti. So um, I want to be you, John. Yeah, you never know, you, you never know when, what's around when, the corner. When you and I meet at graduation, I'm just going to randomly rub your hand because I think you're an incredibly lucky human. You're going to be like my lamp. Um, you're, but, John, that's a great point. And can I say the other point John's given us, I've added Come to the on. list, is... <laughs> Pokemon is, but avoid desperation, John. I think we all, I mean, I've been, I, you know, I've, I've had decades of being desperate, just trying to get a job, right? And when you're desperate, you make huge errors. You make huge errors. So trying to not be desperate is the key. Yeah. Well, go to the, go to the rain and then to beautiful city. Talk to us, Lorraine. Oh, it would help if I muted myself. Um, just to make sure I was clear with my comment earlier. So Whilst obviously what's happening in our life is a personal journey, what I meant by that, sometimes we work in areas where it's they don't operate within the same rules that we may have. So to protect yes. so that actions don't permeate your sense of um, uh, security or, you know, you're feeling vulnerable, sometimes decisions are made cold-heartedly on the face of it it's a money-making decision it's not because somebody's out to deliberately get you so that's what I sort of meant about not letting that to take on that personally not that it's not a personal thing that's happening to you so it's just to not feel victimized within a situation that potentially is just about money and numbers which is harsh but yeah, and sometimes in these big places, it's not okay. It, it's literally it comes down, which isn't pleasant, but that's the reality of life. But I think it's it's a far healthier thing for you to acknowledge that rather than go away feeling the world hates me, they hate me. It must be something wrong with me. Very often, it's nothing to do with that. I think that's amazing. And Thank you. Oh, you're amazing, Lorraine. Can I also say, Jen, coming from Lorraine's remarkable work, the importance of compartmentalisation is absolutely crucial. I've done a lot of work on it, and it's important that you're in this job and these values of this particular job or this boss or whatever is rubbish, so that that's terrible. But you maintain your integrity and compartmentalise your work. Is that right, Lorraine? You're the expert on this. But but so so this is what you can do. This is what you've got control over. This is what you haven't got control over make a living and as Kylie said then leverage and work yourself out of that situation into a better situation situation while you're bringing the dough in are you comfortable Kyle's rock and roll girlfriend let's go to the beautiful city how are you my love you are a wise wise human talk to us my love 
So I missed the first question, but since we're on jobs, I think what yes, I would please. say is um, when you get to the interview phase, um, don't forget to have that uh, vibe check because a lot of times, you know, we have a lot of adrenaline and we're so desperate for the job. Um, there's that inkly feeling where something feels off when you're interviewing with the and the stages of interview. And a lot of times we tend to ignore it. So maybe it's just me being uh, skeptical, but a lot of the times your gut is actually right. And this comes from, you know, my experience with working through corporate. So I've never been in academia as a as a lecturer, except for a small part time stint um, after I left corporate. Um, and that's mainly because both of my but I've lived it through the eyes of my parents. Both of my parents are retired academicians. And they, at one point, we were even living in the university in the housing because they were fellows. So even when I wasn't at my own university, when I came back home, it was in another university. So I grew up in the university environment from the 90s until now. But when I, um, and from day one, my my mom especially is very adamant that I do not join academia because she's seen the dark sides of it. So um, when I went to start doing interviews in corporate, corporate, a lot of them fell off and I trusted myself to say no to the, the ones that fell off. And uh, a lot of times later on, shh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, a lot of the times my gut was right. And later there will be confirmations from my colleagues and network saying, yes, this is not a good place to be. So just don't forget to trust your gut when you go yeah. for interviews. Well said, Sita, and also trust your mates too. So if you've got people in that organisation, talk to your mates. Uh, there's about there's about five new misses I've made. Talking to mates, oh, we've got a beautiful Liam and then beautiful Miranda. Talk to us, Liam. Come on, mate. I'm just going to say, um, a colleague um, spoke to me about my CV um, who hasn't had many moves in their academic career. And they were saying, you've moved around a lot. I've been at six different universities in 11 years okay so I started my journey in 2013 as an associate lecturer I'm now what would be in Australia I'm an assistant professor and um, my second post and um, which is open-ended but in that meantime I've done all sorts and I've been at six different institutions yeah. I'm looking as well you know for the next thing because yeah. we never we never one meal away from being out of the academy I found out recently that an institution that I was at last year, which was meant to be a safe job, um, they're now making people in my faculty redundant. So I would have been on the car park or on the, the M6 motorway with a suitcase um, around about this time if I would have stayed in that job. So I called it quickly and I read Tara's video about calling it the transition from Canada to the UK back to Australia and calling it early you know, knowing when a mistake is made and knowing to call it early. Um, I've been having a really lovely conversation by a um, text message on the chat about my first institution that I worked at, which Tara knows very well. We've got a lot of emotional connection and we've got some very good people still there. Um, I ended up leaving there um, because I was offered a bad deal. You know, I was on six monthly contracts and they wanted to, to dispose of my labour and a few others because we were part of the union, we were outspoken and we didn't stand full for this really. So they was like, how can we get rid of these people, you know, who dissent? So I was offered a bad deal and I went somewhere else. So I, I was very fortunate that I landed in a Russell Group institution, but that wasn't, you know, that was meant to be well-funded and it wasn't. It was, there was so much precarity that I was shocked and, I just feel that no matter what your status is within the academy, especially, you know, myself being, you know, white, working class, um, disabled, et cetera, um, queer, it's like we're, we're one step away from being out of the academy yeah. alongside yeah. our colleagues who have other intersectional characteristics. So... I always think we're only one step away and that's why I'm always looking yeah. for the next thing and I'm knowing when to call it early. So that's just my two piece worth. 
Liam, I think you're changing people's lives. Yeah. Sophia was with you on every step of that. And Liam, mate, I think we have to realise that the, the notion, except for the wonderful Susan, the, the notion that you can be at a university for five or ten years, that's over. So as you continue to move up the ranks, Liam, and you will, and for all the colleagues on this call, everyone who may listen to this, remember to show kindness to somebody's CV. If they've moved around, they have suffered. Nobody moves jobs, nobody moves cities, nobody moves their families if they don't have to. So I mean, oh, it's like it, it was exactly that, Tara. Like, you know, for example, being on the train from Manchester to Stoke-on-Trent at 20 past six in the morning, you know, to get to a nine o'clock lecture to deliver I was very tired still I'm very tired because I still travel a significant distance and you know I'm just I feel lucky that I'm in work and when students say to me like oh how do you get here and I'm like well I feel very fortunate that I'm still that I'm still paid to teach you you know yeah and it's speaking the words Liam and I think you'll change people's lives through this speaking the words about how horrific it is and speaking of the horror and what it exactly feels like to know on any given day you won't be working at that organization at the end of the day and getting up the next morning and doing that again and getting up the next morning and doing that again and doing that for years or decades so showing kindness and compassion to colleagues that have done it tough for decades. So, Liam, that's about Absolutely. everybody on this call. Remembering when you look at a CV and you see movement, come to it with kindness, not questions about what went wrong. And if we can, if we've done that today, we've had a big win, I think. Beautiful Miranda, talk to us, my la my darling one, and welcome. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I just wanted to first thank you all for such a wonderful conversation this morning. I've so much enjoyed listening to everybody's perspectives and I really valued um, them. My question is a little different this morning. Um, it's a little bit of a different topic just in the last few minutes. Um, and Gaz was streaming this morning, so he wasn't able to pop in too. Um, but he's working on the confirmation um, of candidature document and getting that done as quickly as possible. So that will be sent off as the next step. So hopefully that sounds really great. Um, but my question was, can PhD students book lecture theatres to do things like practice their lecture delivery? They probably can't book a lecture theatre, but I imagine certainly they'll be able to look at John going, can I book a lecture theatre? Why haven't I booked a lecture theatre? Randomly. Um, but Miranda, obviously spaces can be booked, spaces can be booked to practice. So I have no issues with that at all. Noting that most COCs, and of course, beautiful Bree and Doug are working on theirs right now. Um, what I'd be doing is practicing online because the, the chances are they're going to be online environments. So I'd be making sure all of that's working. But a really great question, absolutely, Miranda. So keep it working. Yes, I think they can book a seminar room, but I'd be getting the online practice in place. And that's certainly where we're going to be going with Doug. And if I can be of support to Bree, I will be. But great question, Miranda. And look, we'll finish off for the last minute, going back to Sophia. And I'm happy to go here as often as you need to go here, Sophia, my love. But what we, what we need to do for you is that the only advice I'd offer you is apply for everything, uh, don't get mo emotionally invested with anything. Don't tell your right hand what your left hand's doing, Sophia. So when you're applying for this, 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 this job, don't tell any of the jobs that you're applying for other jobs and have about five, 10 all going at the same time. Part-time, full-time, low stakes, high stakes. And as we talked about last week, darling one, apply for everything because you never know when you're not going to get a field. And certainly Jamie and I know as people who have kicked around regional universities and Liam, this is regional uh, UK and Scotland and Wales as well, is that you often don't get a field at all. So apply because that's a way in in tough times. Does that help, Sophia? Adore you. Adore you. Now, Professor Quinton, in our last minute, have I spoken in vain? Are you, as you and I, we've had to apply for lots of jobs, we're old, we hire a lot of people. Anything you'd like to say to correct me uh, as you should? Uh, well, I, I turned up late in the conversation and I apologise for missing the original comment. But uh, my kind of experience is the opposite of Liam. So I feel I'm feeling really emotionally invested in Liam's narrative um, and I, I've kind of experienced it towards the end of my career because I was at one institution for 18 years and now 
I'm finding myself engaging in the academy in its current configuration with where it's a challenging environment to be in. Um, and I, I did that thing where I was in the institution I was in, I was actually reasonably comfortable and I had to make a critical decision of, do I want to just keep treading water and keep dealing with the same challenges and, or do I want to actually try and make a difference and do something okay. different? And, and doing that has now created a trigger point where I now find myself amongst the same challenges that all of us have got, which is the sector is a different place than it was when I was when I was a junior academic. Um, and I'm finding myself applying for lots of things. Now, um, to get to the point, the best way to look at it is right person, right place, right time. And if you are not, if those three things don't line up, don't take it personally. It's not your fault. So don't let your self-esteem be affected by negative outcomes. And in fact, you should expect more negative outcomes than positive ones. So your resilience will be tested, right? Um, if you can't take it personally, you see it as an opportunity, trying to create opportunities, the right opportunity will appear for you if it's meant to happen. It's a healthier way to look at it. And then you don't kill yourself with disappointment. That would be the short, short version from me. And look, we will return to this again, colleagues. I've, I've loved every second of this. And Sophia, to finish us off, when you apply, that's about you. When you're shortlisted, that's about them. And from there, let's win. I'll see many of our colleagues in Right Club. I thank you so much, Liam. Thank you for getting up in the middle of the night. I feel changed. You are precious people. See you soon. Wow. Wow.